Praise God. I tell you, I'm excited about all that God is doing. Amen. Hallelujah. If some of you know what uh, I'm doing here, I wonder what I'm doing. I'm trying to experiment to keep myself limited to a certain time. I have been told that I have a tendency to preach too long. And I know that the heart can only receive what the seat can endure. And so we're going to uh, work on trying to give you enough so it'll take you through the week. Amen. And you'll come back for more. Praise God. Today I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about following God's direction for your life. Following God's direction for your life. How many of you want to know God's will for your life? You've got to learn to follow his directions. Let's look at two verses to start with. In Jeremiah 10, 23, and we're going to put these verses on the screen for everybody to see. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. Now, before I read that, I want you to think about something. How many of you remember a while back, I told you that there's a scripture in the Bible that I just fell in love with a while back. It talks about the foolishness of the man who perverts his way and his heart frets against the Lord. And I told you one translation says, man, men do stupid things and then they blame the Lord for the, for the mess they made of their life. Now, how many of you know it shouldn't be that way? In other words, if your life is messed up, don't blame God. James tells us that when a man is tested and tried, not to blame the Lord. Don't blame God. Don't say it's God's fault because it's not God's fault. How many of you know that God's way is perfect? The way of the Lord is perfect. If you learn to follow God, seriously follow him, your life will turn out for the good. But so many times people want to blame God or they maybe don't blame God, they want to blame somebody else. But you know what, folks, listen to me. God is good all the time. Amen? He is a good God. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from the Father above in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That means he never changes. Amen? He's always been good. He will, he will always be good. God is a good God. And if you want to know God's direction for your life, there's things, there's principles laid out in the Word of God that you must learn to follow, that you must learn to apply into your life. Now, the first verse I want us to look at, it says here in Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. What is Jeremiah saying there? He's saying, you know what? We are not capable of directing our own way in this life. We need help. Somebody tell your neighbor, I need, I need help. Now look with me, please, in Proverbs 16, 9. Proverbs 16 and verse 9. Solomon adds to what Jeremiah said by writing these words. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his step. The Amplified Translation says a man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps and makes them sure. You see, you can have a plan in your mind, but that's not necessarily the right way. You'll have thoughts that'll come to you to do this or do that, but often it's nothing but the leading of the devil or your flesh talking to you or your emotions trying to control you. But you need to understand that God can direct your steps in a path that is sure, in a way that will turn out for your good. You know, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible says that all things work together for good to them that love God. Listen to me, that love God. Do you love him? who are called according to his purpose. You see, we have a calling upon our lives. God wants every person to know that there is a calling, a higher calling that comes from him that will bring you to a higher level of living if you'll simply learn to listen to him and follow his way. Now, I want you to listen too closely to me today because I'm going to tell some things on myself. I made some stupid mistakes in my life. I wish that I had learned at a very young age to follow the Lord. I'm so thankful when I see these kids, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, lifting their hands and worshiping God, loving the Word of God, loving coming to church, crying and upset when they don't get to come to church. You see, that's the way it ought to be. We ought to have such a love for God, as, even as a child, that it will keep us on the path that we should walk in for the rest of our life. But I wasn't given that as a young child. I, didn't, I, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't have parents that took us to the church regularly. And if we did go to church, we didn't go to a good church. We went to one that knew nothing about the power of God. 
We went to churches that, you know, as I got older and knew the people, I watched their lives, and most of them lived uh, just as bad lives as we did. But some of them even worse. I began to realize there's a lot of hypocrites in the church. As a matter of fact, as a teenager, that was my excuse for not going to church anymore. By the time I got to be about 14 years old, I, we didn't go much anyway, but even when Mama did talk Daddy into going, I was like, I don't want to go to church. I hate going to church. Why? I didn't tell her because I know so-and-so, there's a deacon, and he drinks as bad as anybody in the whole county. And so-and-so over here, he's got a wife, but he also got a girlfriend over here. You see? How many of these things ought not to be? Now, y'all listen to me carefully today because I'm going to share some things with you that are going to help you, and I probably won't get through with my thoughts today, but we'll get as far as we can and pick up on it next time, okay? Now, go with me to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. I want to read to you about Abraham and something that happened in his life and how he knew God's direction for his life. Now, the Bible tells us that God had brought Abraham into a certain land. God had told him to never return to the place that he had brought him out of. But when it came time for his son to have a wife, there was not one to be found among the people where he dwelt because the people where he dwelt, the people where he lived at that time, they worshiped other gods. And so he wanted to send his servant back to where his own people dwelt to find a wife. Listen to the first 14 verses as we look in Genesis chapter 24. I'll just begin reading in verse 1. You can look at the screen with me and read along. Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray you, your hand under my thigh. This was their way of making an oath or a promise. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that you shall not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman would not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring your son again into the land from where, from where you came? Abraham said to him, Beware that thou bring not my son there again. Do not take him back there. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spoke unto me, he swore to me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife unto my son from there. And if the woman will not be willing to follow you, then you shall be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son there again. The servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swore to him concerning that matter. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hand, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray you, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water. And the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give your camels drink also. Let the same be she that you have appointed for your servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that you have shown kindness unto my master. Now I'm going to stop right there, because I know we're probably not going to get uh, beyond that part of the story today. Now, let me tell you a little true story. This was written actually in the Reader's Digest some time ago. There was a female flight attendant who had done a lot of traveling in her, her work. And one of the things she had loved every time she flew over the Rocky Mountains, she always said, I sure would love to go there. So one day she just decided to plan a vacation in the Rockies. She rented the place there in the mountains. And upon arriving, the very first day, she met a young man next door to where she was staying who owned a ranch and lived in a, rock, in a log cabin there. And they just hit it off in the very beginning. As a matter of fact, 
They spent every day together. Outside seeding, he was showing the, the mountains and everything, you know, that he knew about the place. And they fell in love. By the end of the week, one week, he proposed to her. And she didn't know what to do. Being a Christian woman, she decided, I better think about this and I better pray about this. And so, flying back to her home on the plane, she was sitting there praying, Lord, what should I do? Am I supposed to marry this man? Is he the right one for me? I need your direction, Lord. Well, she got up to go to the bathroom on the plane, and while in the bathroom, there was turbulence. And all of a sudden, a sign came on that says, please return to the cabin. She took it as a sign, and she did. She went back to the cabin, and she married the man. <laughs> now, folks, that's not the way you want to get your, your direction from the Lord. All right? Thank God it worked out for her, but you don't want to always look for signs to give you the best direction. Amen? How many of you know that the devil would deceive you if you're not careful? I said the devil would deceive you if you're not careful. There is, there is principles in the Word of God that you can learn that will make sure that you make the right decisions. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, that Satan will masquerade as an angel of light. Now, just to give you an idea of where we're going, let me tell you a couple of stories. Uh, sometime back, there was a minister, full gospel minister, who believed the Word of God. He believed in salvation. He believed in God's power to heal. You know, I mean, he'd been preaching the Word for himself for a long time. But then he was diagnosed with cancer, and the doctor told him that he was going to die. And so in prayer one night, all of a sudden an angel appears before him and tells him that it is God's will for you to die with this sickness. Now let me ask you a question. For those of you who have been here for a while anyway, you've been taught the word, what would you do in that situation? You say, well, it was an angel. Did you hear what I said a while ago? The Bible says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. You can't always get your direction from an angel. As a matter of fact, let me tell you this. Even if an angel appeared to you, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul said, if anyone preaches to you another gospel other than what we have preached to, even if it's an angel from heaven, let him be accursed. In other words, if he comes from above, heavenlies, not necessarily the heaven of heavens. That's what he's talking about. See, that angel came and deceived that preacher and caused him to believe it was God's will for him to die with that sickness. But that's not what the Word says. The Bible teaches us that Jesus himself not only took our sins, and he took our sicknesses, he took our diseases, that by his stripes you were healed, the Scripture says. It's God's will for every person to be saved. Not everybody is saved. It's God's will for every person to be healed. Not everybody is healed. It's God's will for every person to be delivered from drugs, alcohol, or whatever they're bound by. But not every person is delivered. You know why? Because the Bible says, whosoever will, let him come and drink freely of the rivers of life. You see, the waters of life is talking about salvation, the power of God. There is a river that flows from the throne of God. And you've got to drink of that river of salvation, of healing, of deliverance. You've got to reach out to God. By grace through faith are you saved. And you've got to learn to listen to him and receive what he has in store for you. God wants to offer you a way to direct your life so that you don't make the mistakes that you've made in the past. Amen? You've got to learn to listen to him. Even prophecy, a lot of people, especially spirit-filled Christians, they are the worst about going to churches and going to special serv services, you like your revivals or things like that, wanting somebody to prophesy to them to give them direction. But let me tell you what prophecy is all about. The Bible says that prophecy is to comfort, it is to edify, which is to build up and to exhort. It's not to give you direction. As a matter of fact, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We're supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? Amen? Not always looking for a prophecy to give us direction. Not wanting for an angel to appear to us to give us direction. No, there's a better way. As a matter of fact, I can tell you this much. A dear friend of ours from way back, as a matter of fact, uh, I led the young man to the Lord. I was his very first pastor. And uh, I know that he was called to preach because the Lord spoke to me. 
And I gave him a word, a prophecy, a word of confirmation. When somebody prophesies to you, it shouldn't be something brand new. It shouldn't be something you've never heard of before or thought of before. It should be just a confirmation. And I prophesied to him in the service one Sunday morning that the Lord was calling him into the ministry. He got up and testified. He had fasted and prayed all day that Sunday and said, Lord, if it's really you calling me to preach, have pastor to confirm it tonight. Sunday night service, the Lord spoke to me, tell him I've called him to preach. That was confirmation. It wasn't something new. That wouldn't give him direction to his life. It was just confirming something he already knew Amen. in his heart. Yeah. yeah, there was questions in his mind because I remember when God called me to preach. Sure, there's questions in your mind that come. The devil doesn't want you to preach the gospel, right? Sometimes as a young person, you need that confirmation. But later on in his life, because he was not listening properly to the teachings of his pastor, he decided he was going to go to this tent meeting. And at a tent meeting, which I warned people about, I didn't feel good about it. This traveling evangelist come through and threw this tent up. I didn't feel good in my spirit about it. I didn't want my people to go to it because I knew there's just something not right about this. As a matter of fact, he got prophesied to in that tent meeting, and it was the craziest thing you'd ever heard. And somehow he took that prophecy and he ran with it, and he almost ruined his marriage and almost ruined his life. You don't just go off, you know, on a tangent because somebody prophesies to you. Amen. Take off and go across the country somewhere and do some crazy stuff. You better learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And follow the principles of God's Word. We all want to be in God's will, right? We all want the decisions we make to be the right ones. Now, let me give you the first principle that you need to understand, and that is this. Being led requires knowing God's Word, knowing what God has said. It can be in the Bible, but there's times when God will speak to our hearts something that's not in the Bible concerning who to marry, concerning a job or a business, and you won't find it in the stay with me now, okay? This is very important. But one of the first things you need is a working knowledge of the Word of God, a working knowledge, not just a mental ascent, not just head knowledge that causes you to get puffed up, the Bible says. I mean, that knowledge can puff you up. There's people who can quote all kinds of scriptures, but in their heart, they have no revelation whatsoever. See, you need a working knowledge of God's Word. Something that you use on a daily basis. You know what God has said. When it comes to divine healing, folks, for example, I have a working knowledge of God's word. I know what he says. I know what he wants. I know what he desires. He wants me to be healed and to live in divine health. And he wants the same thing for every person who will receive it. Listen to what David said in Psalm 119, 105. He said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You need to know God's Word. You need to know God's written Word first and foremost, and then you need to know His voice. Now, we'll talk about that later, but not, not right now, not today, okay? Let's look at Psalms 119, 133, and I want to read it to you from the Amplified Translation. Psalms 119. Now, if you want to mark these in your Bible, just jot them down, that's fine. But I encourage you to study these for yourself, and later on, at least at some point, sit down and Mark them in your Bible so you can go back to it easily. Here is Psalm 119, 133. David writes in the Amplified, Establish my steps and direct them by means of your word. Let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Let not iniquity have dominion over me. There are the iniquities of the fathers the Bible talks about that passes down to the third and the fourth generation. David said, I don't want what my father did the sins that he had in his life to pass on down to me. I don't want to follow that step. I don't want to follow that direction. I want my steps to be ordered by your word so that I'll be pleasing in your sight, so that I'll know that I'm in your will, so that I know that I'm following the right direction for my life. Now listen to me carefully. God's word is his will. I said God's word is his will. Now growing up, from time to time, I would hear my mama pray. And then when, we, when I did start going to church as a uh, young man uh, at the age of 18, well, actually I started going a little bit earlier than that and I got saved. I was 18. And I would hear people pray in this little country church where I got saved down in South Georgia. Constantly I would hear them pray and they would end that prayer with, if it be thy will. But then I began to discover something. 
Faith begins where the will of God is known. It is not scriptural to pray if it be thy will. Now, what if somebody came to me today after this service and said, Pastor, I want to be born again. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and I believe he rose from the dead, and I have messed up my life by living a life of sin, and I'm ready to be born again. I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Now, what would y'all think of me if I grabbed him by the hand, and I said, when you pray this prayer, and I, and I led him in a prayer, I believe Jesus died. I believe he rose from the dead for my sin. I believe with my heart, and I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And Lord, if it be thy will, save this man. Every one of you would know I done, I done lost my mind. Why? Because you know it's God's will to save him. Why would we say, if it be thy will? Because we know it's God's will. We don't pray if it be thy will. You see, the only time somebody would pray if it be thy will would be if they didn't know what the will of God was. You say, well, where does that prayer come from? People took, as Peter said, people took scriptures and they twisted it to their own destruction. They took what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was crucified. He said, Lord, not my will be done, but yours. That don't say, sound like if it be thy will. That is a prayer of consecration. When Paul was about, he held the last pastor's conference. He called all the pastors together. He shared many things with them. He knew that he may never see them again because he was going to Rome to stand before Caesar. They were putting him on trial for preaching the gospel. Y'all remember that? And as they gathered there at the shore before he got on the boat, they began to weep, and he said, they prayed this way, the will of the Lord be done. There are times in the prayer of consecration when you do not, do not know what's ahead, you must say, the will of the Lord be done. I am trusting that God's will will be done in this situation. But folks, when it comes to things we know God's will, just lay down in his word, we don't have to pray if it be thy will. Amen? Now stick with me. This is very important that you get this today, okay? Go with me to 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. 1 John chapter 5. Again, I'm going to read from the Amplified. And maybe we can just put this up on the screen for everybody to see from the Amplified as well. 1 John 5, verse 14. Now, the Amplified, I mean, the King James simply says, this is the confidence that we have in him if we ask anything according to his will. According to his will, he hears us. So if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, right? The Amplified says, we have this confidence, assurance, the privilege of boldness, which we have in him, we are sure that if we ask anything, make any request according to his will, in agreement with his own plan, he listens to and hears us. And if, since we positively know that he listens to us in whatever we ask, we also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted us as our present possession the request made of him. So you see, folks, God's word is his will. And all we have to do is ask what we know that is according to his will in agreement with his own plan. We know when we ask that, he hears us, and he gives it to us. Amen? So now listen, Abraham, if you go back and read those uh, second, third, and fourth verses, the Bible makes it very clear that Abraham is taking steps. He calls his servant in. He gives him, he makes him promise. He gives him clear direction of where to go and what he wants him to do to find Isaac a wife. He's not just sitting there, as some people say, waiting on God. You know, there is a biblical uh, mandate of waiting on God, but it's not what most people think it is. Most of the time when you hear people say, I'm waiting on God, they are simply just sitting there doing nothing. But I'm telling you, that's not what waiting on God is all about. Amen? It doesn't mean doing nothing. You've you got to learn to listen to the Lord. Listen to this, Psalms 27, 14. Let's, 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 everybody, I want you all to look at this. Mark this in your Bible in Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. The Amplified Translation says, wait, hope for, and expect the Lord. Wait, hope for, and expect the Lord. Don't just sit there and do nothing. See, waiting on God in the Hebrew is a, the Hebrew is a pictorial type language. It pictures 
action, doing something. You're waiting. You're like the man at the, at the line who's about to run a race, and the guy's got the gun raised, and you're in your, you're, you're ready to take off. You, you got the picture here? You're expecting something. When the Lord sent us to Tulsa, Oklahoma, actually the broken arrow to Oklahoma to go to attend Raymond Bible College many, many years ago, we went, checked in a hotel because we knew God said to go and that we were to go to the Bible school. I did not have a job waiting on me. I didn't have a house waiting on me. Matter of fact, we gave, we sold everything we could, gave the rest of it away. We loaded up, went to Tulsa, checked in a hotel. I got up the next morning. First thing I did is I grabbed a paper and I started looking for a job. How many of you are looking for a job? You don't sit at home and wait. They're not going to come to your house looking for you. <laughs> if you're waiting on the Lord, that means you're getting up and you're doing something. You cannot. We, you, how many of you, how, any of you here beside me learned to drive the old, uh, uh, not, not power steering, what do you call it? Huh? No straight ship and they didn't have power steering, rack and pinion, I think what it was called in those days. It was hard to turn those yeah. wheels. As a matter of fact, it, you couldn't turn it unless you were moving. I said, you couldn't turn it if it wasn't moving. It had to be moving for it to turn at all. Because I mean, you, as a kid learning to drive when I was only, you know, just 11, 12 years old, I'd have to get up on that old pickup truck, that big steering wheel. I had to get up on it. It's just, I mean, it was hard to turn, you know. So you can't, God cannot lead a person who is not moving. I couldn't sit at that hotel and just say, Lord, I'm asking you for a job, and I'm just going to sit right here until you provide it. Because nothing would have happened. We'd have still been sitting there. Y'all hear you know what I'm saying? So what did I do? I got a paper and I started looking for a job. And here's a job. So I go over there. I got the first job they offered me. It was a, a Orkin Pest Control. They told me you got to shave your beard and get an Oklahoma license. Shave my beard. They tell me how to get there. I'm moving. Now they didn't told me what they'd pay me and it wasn't what I was believing for. A lot of time when you say I'm believing for something and you don't, they don't offer it to you, you walk out. That's ridiculous. I said, I'll take it. It wasn't what I was wanting. It wasn't what I was trusting God for. But I said, I'll take it, Lord. This is back in 80, 89. Okay? And I, I told the Lord, I said, I, I, I need $500 a week. That's what I'm believing for. And they offered me about three fifty dollars somewhere in there, you know. Went and shaved the beard. They said, now go over downtown over here or this place over here, I mean, and get your license. So I'm going. And while I'm going, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. The Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, go to the newspaper. I had a newspaper background experience. I went to the newspaper. Guess what? They hired me that day. And guess what they did? They started me at the next to the top pay level, $500 a week, with a promise that within three months that they would move me to the top if I could do what I told them I could do. And my former boss told them. And within three months, I was at top pay level in the company, in that position I'm talking about. See, I had to be moving. But now, how did I learn these things? How did I learn to follow the Holy Spirit? Not long after we got, uh, we, we were saved, and, or at least when my wife and I was married, we started practicing. I'd been saved for a while when me and her got married. But we started practicing listening to the Holy Spirit. Because this was before we had cell phones. I don't know what in the world people do without cell phones. You know how we communicated as husband and wife back then? By the Holy Ghost. Now, here's the way I started practicing. Listen to the Holy Ghost. If I couldn't find my car keys, and I remember vividly one time I could not. How many of you ever lost your car keys and can't find them? Is that not the most aggravating thing? I mean, it would just drive you up the wall. You done turned the house upside down. You still can't find those keys. And so one day, you know what I did? I said, you know what, Holy Spirit? I am not going to drive myself nuts trying to find those keys. You know where they are. And I'm going to practice listening to you. The Bible says he awakens our ear morning by morning. He created the eye to see and the ear to hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen? As many as are led by the Holy Spirit. They are the sons of God. I said, I know that I'm saved, and I know that you're in me. The same one that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me. And I know that you could talk to me. So I said, Holy Spirit, where are those car keys? And all of a sudden, this thought down in here rose up from down inside, came to me, and I went and looked, and there were my car keys. And I thought, hot dog. 
man, I am on to something now. And my wife and I began to practice this because, uh, it, you know, it, it, at one point I had this uh, company building houses, remodeling, had a couple of crews. So I was here and I was there. I was all over the place, you know. And uh, she was a stay-at-home mom. And so uh, there were times, and you know how it is, people, when, you know, somebody's at home and you need a, a loaf of bread or you need a gallon of milk or something or whatever, and she would say, Holy Spirit, I ask you to tell Eddie to call me. And I'd have this thought to call before I went home. And I'd stop at a pay phone or wherever, you know, and I'd call her and I said, you need me? She said, yeah, I need you to bring me this. That's how we communicated. <laughs> if there was something wrong with one of the children and she needed to get a hold of me and she knew that I wasn't at an office somewhere, a lot of times I wasn't even in my office. I was on the road somewhere. I was on a job somewhere. And she would say, Holy Spirit, I need Eddie to call me. And, and I'd, I'd get this quickening on the inside. Something wrong. And I'd call her. I said, what's going on? That's the way we learn to communicate is by the Holy Spirit. And it's important that you learn to listen to him because you may get in your car to go to work one day and he may say, don't go the way you always go. Why? Because the enemy's trying to set a trap for you. And he wants you to go some, a different route to avoid an accident because the devil may be trying to set an ambush. Folks, this is important that you learn to listen to what I'm telling you now because we're talking about waiting on God, listening to him, expecting for him to show up, expecting for him to give us clear direction in our lives. So I'm talking about an expectant waiting. How many of you, how many of you ladies have ever been an expectant mother? Let me see your hand. What do expectant mothers do? They start, wait a minute, they start preparing for something. Why? Because they're expecting for something to show up. They're expecting that baby to, to manifest. So they start preparing for it. See, a lot of times people say, well, I'm believing God for this and I'm believing God for that. Now, are you really? Now, what have you done in way of preparation? Huh? What have you done in way of preparation? A lot of people say, well, I'm just believing God one day. I, I, I'm going to be a business owner. What kind of business? What books have you read? What classes have you took? Have you ever had involved in that type of business with somebody else, working for somebody else before? What are you doing to prepare yourself? You see, a lot of people, they think that God's just going to drop something out of the sky on them one day. It's not going to happen that way, folks. It's not going to happen that way. Now, listen carefully. Abraham was directed not by his desires, but by his knowledge of God's Word. He knew what God's Word was. He knew what God's will was, that his son was not to marry one of the Canaanite women. Now write this down if you're taking notes. He was guided by a principle. Abraham was guided by a principle. He was not guided by his flesh, by his own desires. He was not guided by his emotions. He was not even guided by his needs. See, a lot of people think that God moves based on our needs. That's not true. If that was true, then he would do great things down in Haiti tonight. And everybody get up in the morning. Everybody's got a house. Everybody's got food. Everybody's got a car. No, there's great needs there, but God's not moved by needs. And you need to be guided, directed, based on certain principles, and that is knowing God's word, knowing God's will for your life. As a matter of fact, it became a way of living for the children of Israel. Look with me in 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 1. This is very, I want y'all to see this for yourself. 1 Kings 11, 1. It says, but King Solomon loved many strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Now, folks, listen to you. You know as well as I do that Solomon had had God appear to him twice. God had given him such wisdom. But you know what, folks? No matter how spiritual you may think you are, don't ever get to the point that you think, well, you know, I got it whipped now. I, I got this thing whipped now, you know. I, you know, I, I, I'll never have, have to deal with temptation again. Oh, yeah, you are. 
You're going to have to deal with temptation. You're going to have to go through tests and trials in this life. Matter of fact, Jesus promised you there's going to be tribulation. Amen. He said, but be a good cheer. I've overcome the world. The Israelites were forbidden to marry foreign women who worshipped other gods. Verse 4, it says, it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. His heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Verse 11 says, Wherefore the Lord said to Solomon, For as much as this is done of you, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely rend or tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Isn't that something? In other words, God was not going to bless a marriage to the Canaanite women or to the heathen women because God knew that those women would draw their hearts away to serve and to follow after other gods. Man, how many times have I seen it happen? You know, a lot of times people don't understand that they need to be guided by principles because it's not always written in the Word of God exactly what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But if you've got the guiding principles working inside of you, they will keep you grounded. They will keep you uh, going in the right direction because you've got a principle here. What does God's Word say? Today, for example, we live in a society that is saying that it's okay for two men to get married or two women to get married. The Word of God has never changed. It says that a man shall not lie with another man. It is an abomination. The word, it's a principle, folks. We're not hating anybody. Will y'all please listen to me? We're not hating anyone. We're not hating homosexuals. We're not hating lesbians. God doesn't hate people. We don't hate people. There are guiding principles that you must have in your life in order to live a life pleasing to God and to have his blessings. Are y'all with me now? Yeah. Nowhere in the Bible are you going to open and find where it is written a commandment. Thou shalt not watch Hot Mamas on Playboy Channel. It doesn't say that in there. Are y'all hearing me? That's not written in there. But you know what is in there? There's principles of God's word laid out. That if a man looks at a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery already in his heart. That's the principle right there. We have to be guided by principles of purity, of holiness, of righteousness. Listen to this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. The Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain. Everybody say abstain. You know what that is? That's abstinence. Abstinence from the very appearance of evil. If you flirt with sin long enough, guess what? Mm -hmm. You flirt with it long enough, you're going to slip in. I remember a preacher telling a story about uh, this, a pastor had a man in his church. He came down to the altar. He was praying. The pastor slipped down beside him. And the Holy Ghost said, tell him this. And he said to the man, he said, get rid of your sin or your sin is going to get rid of you. A few Sundays later, the man's back down at the altar. He's under conviction. The Holy Ghost said, tell him this. And he went back down and he said, get rid of your sin or your sin is going to get rid of you. That happened three times. But you know what? The man didn't get rid of his sin. And you know what was happening? He was sleeping with another man's wife. And the other man was a businessman. He had gone on a trip. And for some reason, he came home early, and he caught the man in the bed with his wife, and he shot and killed him. Was he not warned three times, get rid of the sin, or the sin is going to get rid of you? And he died in his sin. Somebody said, well, you know, at least he was going to church, and, you know, he probably got saved at some point in his life, and he was saved. Right, so you're going to sit there and try to tell me a man dies in adultery, and he's going to go to a place called heaven? I don't think so. We'll debate that another time if you want to, but not right now. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.15, Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. What's it talking about? It's talking about the house of sin. 
It's talking about anywhere where there's sin. Avoid it. Pass not by it. You got a problem with alcohol, don't go by the liquor store every day after work. Amen? You got an old girlfriend been hitting on you, don't go by her house every morning. Find another way to go. Are y'all hearing me? Listen to me. Listen to this. In 1 Kings 15, 5, the Bible says that David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life except only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. That's pretty powerful right there. But yet that one sin cost him dearly. That one sin cost David. It cost him the life of the child. The Bible says that God told him the sword would never depart from his house from generation after generation after generation. And it's not only that, part of the kingdom was taken away from him because of that one sin. And it says except for that, he never turned aside from any of the commandments of the Lord. That kind of reminds me of the rich young ruler. He said, what must I do to be saved? Jesus began to tell him certain commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Don't steal, don't kill. He said, I've kept all these from my youth up. Jesus said, but you lack one thing. And I've always said that's pretty good if you only lack one thing. But go ahead and deal with the one thing. As a matter of fact, y'all listen to me carefully. Most people, they have a major problem with one thing, not a whole bunch of them. Most people have a major problem with one thing. And you know what his one thing was? His one thing was his love for money. It is not money that is the root of all evil. It is the love of money that's the root of all evil. He was a very wealthy man, and Jesus told him to sell what you have, give to the poor. He said, you'll have treasure in heaven. And he went away sorrow. Why? He grieved, the Bible says. He felt loss. He didn't see what Jesus was telling him as gain. He saw it as loss. But he'll handle one thing. And I have no doubt whatsoever if he was willing to do what the Lord told him to do, the Lord would have made him richer than he'd ever been. Because the Bible says that you give to the poor, it's lending to the Lord, and the Lord will repay. Amen. Amen? Now, let me tell you what happened to David. You'll read this in 2 Samuel chapter 11. The Bible says that one evening, David was walking upon the roof of the king's house. And from there, he saw a woman washing herself. That's what the Bible says. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Now, what should he have done at that very moment? The Bible says, avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, pass away. Listen, he says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Right then, he should have made a decision. You know what? I am going to uh, lock the door that goes to the top of the house because I'm not going to be catching myself up here every night see if I can watch her. Or being the king, he could even send a message to her. You don't need to be taking a bath out there because the people can see you naked. He needed to deal with what was in his heart. Okay? But he didn't. And instead, you know what he did? He sent for the woman. He had sex with her. He got her pregnant. Her husband, Uriah, was in the army. And because Uriah would not come home and sleep with his wife, he refused to. He was a man of honor. He said, I will not. They even brought him home. And he said, go to your house and stay with your wife tonight before he returns to the battle. Got up next morning, he was sleeping out on the steps. Why did you sleep out here? He said, because Joab, my commander, and the army, my brothers in the, in the battle, they're out there fighting. He said, and why should I have this ease to go home and to eat a meal at my house and to sleep with my wife when they're out there on the battlefield? David didn't try to get him drunk the next night so he'd go home and sleep with her. Some people say, well, why shouldn't I drink? Because that right there is enough for most of you right there. Because once you get a couple of drinks in you, then you're going to go over here and do all kind of crazy stuff. <laughs> Abstain from it. Abstain from the appearance of evil. Right. Turn from it. Well, anyway, he's finally just sitting back to the battle. So put him on the front line until he get killed. And I'm telling you, it cost him very, very dearly. Folks, let me tell you something about the strange woman. Me and y'all listen to me for a minute. I don't have time to go into all the details of it, but the Bible says she flatters with her words. She flatters with her words. Oh, you sure do have big muscles. 
Her lips drip honey as a honeycomb. Her mouth is smoother than oil. She'll take you captive with her eyelids. She wears the attire of a harlot. Her feet abide not in her own house. She's in the streets. She's in the clubs. Go with me to Proverbs 7. Proverbs chapter 7. I sure thought I'd get past this first principle, but I'm not. Proverbs. Y'all stick with me here. Proverbs 7. Somebody let children of the church know we're going to be going just a little bit over. I don't want them to feel rushed. Proverbs 7. It says, verse 1, My son, keep my words. Lay up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live in my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon your fingers. Write them upon the table of your heart. Say unto wisdom, you are my sister. Call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep you from the strange woman, from the stranger which flatters with her words. At the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youth a young man, void of understanding. The Amplified says simple, empty-headed, empty-hearted. I perceived among the youth a young man, void of good sense. Passing through the street near her corner, he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with a tire of a heart, heart and subtle of heart. Let me tell y'all something. There's a way that you should live. And if you'll live the right way, you'll stay out of a lot of trouble. I said, you'll stay out of a lot of trouble. In 1973, I was 16 years old. I was in the 11th grade. I wasn't brought up in church. My family was a bu rough bunch of people. Now, I'm talking about rough bunch. I'm talking about fighting. I'm talking about cussing. I'm talking about drinking and all kind of stuff. Now, my mama had been a Christian since she was a girl. She married my dad out of the will of God against the will of her mom and daddy. He was not a Christian. She was. And guess what? My, my, my grandmother told my mama, you made your bed hard and you got a lie in it. And they, that's just the way it was back then. You married, you were married for life. Now, at least in, in, that, in all of my family anyway, regardless of what, and I begged my mama to leave many times. I mean, it was bad. It was rough growing up, folks, in my home, around my people. But anyway, uh, my dad would let us stay out late at night. Now, anybody who's got any good sense should know that there's nothing out there. There's nothing good out there. Y'all hear me? After about 10 o'clock at night, your children need to be home. You let them out on the streets at 11, 12 o'clock, you are asking for trouble. Well, I'm out there late one night. You see, my dad told me and my brother, this was his rule. When I wake you up, you get up. I don't care how what time you come in at night, as long as you get up when I call you. And we jumped up because we knew what was coming next, and we didn't jump up when he called us. And we was out there late one night, you know, and I saw this girl. And this girl told me, and I'd been knowing her for a couple years, and she told me, she said, uh, I'm not living at home anymore. She was the same age I was, 16 years old, 11th grade. She said, uh, I'm not living at home anymore. I'm living with my older sister. Right down the street, told me where it was, gave me the address. Come by and see me. So I started slipping by there to see her. The thing is, see, about a year and a half before that, before I was old enough to drive and even had a car, I had a cousin who had a car. He was two years older than me. He had this real nice Chevrolet, and uh, boy, that thing was fly, too. Boy, it was something. And uh, he was a good mechanic. He had that thing all fixed up, you know. And so uh, he couldn't get a girlfriend. My brother and my older cousin couldn't get a girlfriend. My brother didn't have a car, but my cousin did. And so uh, I liked that girl, the girl I'm talking about. I liked that girl. She liked me. We didn't have a way to get out and go. So we fixed him up with a cousin of hers. Because I knew if we could get him fixed up with a girl, then I'd have a ride. <laughs> and sure enough, so we, we, we started dating. We went together for over a year. And then various things happened, and we broke up. So I, I've been knowing her a long time. And I knew better than go back, go, go back. But because of the way I'm living, I wasn't saved. I didn't go to church. I started slipping up there going to the house. 
Her sister was about 10 years older than her. Her husband was in prison. And they lived there, the two of them, alone. Huh? Oh, yeah, great family. Some people would say trashy. Mine and the hers. Okay? And, uh, but I'm just telling y'all, I'm going to live a testimony of what God can do, what God, how God can change you. All right? So anyway, uh, one night, somebody, this guy walks in, this man walks in. Now, you have to understand, folks, I'm not like most of the boys. I wouldn't like most of the boys are today. Most of the boys today are soft, and I'm not insulting any of you boys, you know, at all. But I'm just telling you things are different now. I had to work hard growing up. I'm talking about worked out in the woods with bare hands, loading wood, cutting wood with an axe and that kind of stuff. We didn't have uh, indoor plumbing. We drew water from a well. We built fire in the fireplaces and the wood heater. We didn't have indoor heating, okay? And I was tough. I, was, I, I mean, I was. I was tough. We were the kind of guys, if anybody's looking for a fight, we're ready. That ain't the way it should be, okay? But I'm just telling you that's the way it was. This man walks in the door. Don't even knock it up. Just walk in. And I'm like, who's this? And she's got this wild, crazy look on her face. And she says, that's my husband. I'm like, what? Come to find out she'd met by going to the prison with her sister to see her husband, the sister's husband. She'd met this guy in prison. And they had wrote for a while. And he actually got married while he's in prison. He got out and didn't even let her know and came home unexpected. And guess who's standing in his living room, in the living room with his wife? Me. And before I realized what's going on, he's fast as lightning. He had a switchblade, and he came straight at my neck. And thank goodness I was fast too because I caught his arm. I caught his wrist about the time the knife got to my neck. Now, he was tough, but he wasn't tough enough because I took it away from him. <laughs> and thank God I didn't kill him. But I did get cut. As a matter of fact, I got, the more I thought about it, the matter I got, went home and got my gun. And I was going to kill him. And my dad saw me going out the house, out, out the door with the gun. He said, where are you going with that gun? And I told him. I said, I better go kill this guy. I was bleeding. I had blood running all down me. I said, I'm going to kill him. He took the gun away from me. And I probably would have. I probably would have killed him if my dad hadn't stopped me. You know what the Bible says? Listen to this, folks. Let me read some more of that to you. Right out of the Bible. Here's what it says. Proverbs 2.18, her house inclines unto death and her path unto the dead. Proverbs 5.4 says, in the end, she's bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged and devouring sword. I'm telling you what, folks, going to the wrong place, being in the wrong place, almost got me killed. Are y'all hearing me? We need to make sure that we are following a divine principle of living pure, of living holy, of abstaining from every appearance of evil. There are shows on TV that some of you are watching you shouldn't be watching. Listen to me. Men, if there's anything that stirs your flesh up to lust, you need to get rid of it. Some of you shouldn't even have a smartphone or a laptop or a computer at all. You know when Jesus said, if your right hand offends thee, cut it off, that's exactly what he was talking about. Get rid of anything that the devil is using as a handle in your life. Get rid of it. Make sure you're allowing a divine principle to drive you, to carry you, to direct your steps. That you'll be like David, direct my steps, O Lord, according to your word. If you would, bow your heads real quickly with me. Holly, if you would, come on up for the piano for just a moment. I want everybody to just bow your heads for a moment. Hallelujah. Father, thank you so much for your precious holy word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for Jesus who died for us. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And I'm so thankful, Father God, that one day that you came to me, you opened my eyes, you showed me what was ahead of how that I was headed for a burning hell, but yet I could escape through Jesus and his love. Through his blood, I could receive forgiveness of my sin and be saved. If there's anybody here today with every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you're watching online, 
and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you may be here and you say, Pastor, I have messed my life up. But I realize that God is a God of mercy. I realize He's a God of the second chance, the third chance, or however many chances you need. When you will come to Him believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you shall be saved. But whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. With the heart man believes in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If that's you, you're here today. I'm not going to call you up here. Right where you are, the whole church is going to pray out loud together with you. But if that's you, you say today, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to be born again. I'm on the wrong path, and I'm ready to turn things around. With God's help, I'm ready to get on the path that leads to everlasting life. The path that leads to the blessing of the Lord. And I'm ready to repent of sins and to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand right now. Anyone at all, I see that hand. Anybody else, I see that hand. Anybody else, just go ahead. Yeah, there's a hand. Anybody else, you may say, well, I've been saved. Yes, I see that hand. You may say, I've been saved, but I backslid. And I need to come back to God today. I'm ready to get my life back on the right path. I want to come back to the family of God. I want to receive forgiveness. I want to rededicate my life to Him. If that's you, just come on, lift your hand. With these, as already said, I want to be saved. Now, if you would, please pray from your own heart and pray out loud and believe God. Know that He hears you. It is His will for you to be saved. It is His will for you to come back to Him. So pray this prayer out loud. Church, pray with us. Lord God Almighty, I believe with all my heart that Jesus died for my sin. That he rose from the dead and he is alive today. So right now, with my mouth, I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I repent and turn from all my sin. I surrender my life to you, Lord. Your word says that we're saved by grace through faith. I receive you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's lift our hands and thank God. Just thank God right now. Begin to say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for washing me in the blood of Jesus. Thank you for giving me the gift of eternal life. Thank you for being so good to me, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, you are good, and your mercy endures forever. Praise God. Isn't God good? Amen. Hallelujah. I hope this has helped somebody today.